Hi, this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and I'm here today with Robert Fumo, and we're going to talk about uh, his ancestor research and his many trips to Italy, So, and also his book. So welcome, Robert. Thanks for being here. Thank you. There's so much to unpack in the book, and you have so many interesting stories. So I think I'll start with just asking you, you know, what prompted you to, you know, look back and, and find the family? Uh, that's an interesting question. First of all, I had a father that was 5'4", with kind of brown hair, and a mother who was 5'2", with uh, brown, castagna, they called it, you know. I came out with bright red hair, 6'2", 220 by the time I was 12 years old. So I always was like, what? what's going on here? What kind of Italian am I? You know, all my relatives, <laughs> including my, my one brother, my other brother was redhead. So I was, you know, I kind of re started researching this. So I moved to Brazil in 1970. And obviously they speak Portuguese in Brazil. And I, as I listened to the Portuguese, I realized that I was understanding a lot of it because it wasn't that much different from Italian. So at the end of the two years, I really, I learned Portuguese. And I said, this is crazy. I'm Italian uh, and I can speak Portuguese better. So I started really getting into the Italian language and trying to learn that. This was long-winded, I hope. <laughs> then... Um, I moved to Vienna, Austria, which is uh, by car, an eight-hour trip to Italy. And I, I don't know how many times I took that trip. I went down to see my grandmother in this little town my uncle was living at that time. And, and from there, I just, I was the only person in this family including nephews and nieces, that had the slightest bit of interest. And I'm sure you've encountered this with a lot of Italian Americans, probably yeah. a lot of, a lot of, my brother was born there. He really didn't have that much of an interest and in, his first language was Italian, but he was 15 years older than me. He didn't speak Italian. I did bring him back to his, the town where he was born. He, he could barely speak anything. He was 70-some years old at the time. Anyway, so I did my DNA. I said, this, you know, this red hair thing is really getting me. <laughs> <laughs> I sent you a picture. Uh, yeah, yeah, red yeah. Hair. Well, was, well, no, it, well, you know, it's funny. I have a cousin, only actually him and his sister, uh, out of nine brothers and sisters from my mom's family, and my cousin was Johnny Red. He had red hair. No clue. Well, I, uh, my wife is Sicilian. With her, she had no idea, nor did her mother, who was Sicilian, grew up in a Sicilian family in Queens. They really had no idea. And so I started to research for their family and my family. In my book, I wrote about a grandfather that I had. Uh, that no one knew anything about. They knew he died in Philadelphia and they knew he was murdered. Why? And the, so about three years ago or more, I contacted the Philadelphia Library who had two articles about his murder. Then I contacted, the, I tried to get as many contacts as I can. I finally got the police contact. And they had a record of what had happened. And so I found his, um, his grave, a potter's grave with the little, what the hell are they called? The little daughters or little sisters of Mary or something got him from the police station and buried him in this potter's grave. Now, I, I don't know that my father even knew that. My father was in Italy when he was murdered. And my father came over here when he was like 21. I don't even think he knew about his father. Back to the DNA. I send the DNA. It comes back 93% Italian. 
the rest, North African, you know, whatever, uh, I'm, still didn't account for the red hair. <laughs> Apparently, the red hair pops up every, ogni tanto, they say. The red hair, ha, ha, just that if you have the right mixture, mother and father, the mutant gene pops up. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine me. I don't know if you read the story about. I did. I did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I spent my whole life explaining that I wasn't Irish. <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, I didn't know what it was. They used to say, who I age. And I thought it was I, I had some, something bad. I didn't know what that was <laughs> at first. But uh, yeah, so I think. I just plus I'm a history person anyway, but I'm I'm thinking maybe if it wasn't for the red hair, I wouldn't have tried to do the research on it. Not I've been there three, I, you know, I don't know, thirty times or so. Um, and I've been to Sicily for my wife's uh, family too, and uh, they had they knew nothing about the family, absolutely nothing. Well, yeah. Anyway, but but you have but you have the height too. Besides, besides the red hair. I, I, uh, well, I shrunk down because I'm getting well, old. Well, but yeah, I, who does it? <laughs> but I, I was six two. That I just got the, uh, the the files from my father's military service. He was five four. He was eighteen years old. He fought in the only. Uh, engagement in the First World War that the Italians won. They fought at Vittorio Veneto uh, and they beat the uh, Austrians back. Uh, years later in the 70s, after he was in the United States, the Italian government found him and gave him a medal of whatever it was, uh, Medaglia d'Oro uh, for and they, he was knighted as the first first class class cavalier because he fought in that uh, thing. But he never said it. He never told me anything. I don't know if you had any experiences with people that have been in the war. They don't say anything. It, you know, must not have been too much fun for them to repeat it. But uh, yeah, and I'm still actually I'm still doing research for friends of mine. You know, the Italians are. I had two very good friends. They both were born in Africa. One was in Ethiopia and one was in, uh, in, in Tunis. You know, the Italians before the, the wars went over. They, they, in fact, it was the, I had an uncle that was killed in um, uh, Eritrea in, in 1896 fighting the Ethiopians. And so my friends know nothing about their background because it was an Italian soldier that came over and got together with a, an Eritrean woman and the, the family started in Ethiopia. We don't even know. But the, anyway, I'm doing research on for him, too. I'm trying to find out about his grandfather. Right now, so your father, your father was mm -hmm. born like in... Uh, what, 1880 or something like that, right? A a 1899. 1899. And he was, you know, they, in when they did a draft, they you were chosen by your class. Your class was 1899. They, they brought up that whole class. So he was, he was part of this group called the Ragazzi di Novantanove, the Boys of 99, because that's the group that, Beat back the Austrians at Victoria Veneto. Yeah, yeah, he was uh, he he was like forty some when I was born. It's not an interesting mm. thing is my mother was twenty seven or so when she came over here with my brother. I, that was nineteen twenty seven. She was born in nineteen hundred. Right. So, and and I don't I don't remember if it was a grandfather or an uncle. That uh, I get was he in his seventies when he married a woman in the in a th around thirty or something like that? Because my great grandfather was sixty when he married a woman thirty. So he 
this is my great grandfather. This is really a very <laughs> weird story. <laughs> I knew nothing about this guy. So I'm in Italy one time in the in the hometown, and I'm up in a, a, a you know they call it a bar. It's, it was a cafe, and there were a bunch of guys playing cards. And I said to the barista, I said. He was the guy was drinking. You know, in Italy, they drink those weird colored drinks, whatever they are. I don't know these aperitifs or something. This guy was drinking a weird colored drink, and I pointed to him or to the drink, and I said, uh, "Come say." I said to the barista, "Come say well, meaning, what do you call that drink? He said, "Oh, that's a that's a Nesto Fumo." I said, "Nesto Fumo? Who the hell?" So I, I walked over to the guy and I said, you know, I introduced myself. I'm Robert Foom, my father's Frank. And he didn't even bother. He was playing the game of poker. He just said, I'm your uncle. I said, what? <laughs> You're my uncle. <laughs> so I go back. I was staying with my mother, my father's sister at the time. And I go back and I said, I just met some guy in the bar upstairs. He says, he's my uncle. She says, oh, you met the Chucho. <laughs> like, what the? <laughs> what is this all about? When I got back to America, I questioned my father. I said, who the hell is this guy in this? He said, he's my uncle. Because my, hit my, my father's fa a grandfather, his wife died. He was 70-some years old. He married a 27-year-old had this Ernesto, and it, I guess it was a Vergogna because they, they they just discounted him. He lived in this small little town. And I said, no, nah, this can't be. This is ridiculous. I mean, what the hell did the guy have to do with the fact that he was born? Next time I went back, I took him out to lunch and, you know, kind of said, I accept you in the family. I don't know about the rest of the people, but it was a weird story. <laughs> Third time I went back, I went, I went to my aunt looking for Zio Nesto. And they said, uh, I had more for Zio Nesto. Oh, God, that's too bad. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard this term for, before, but his Monte Nuta is still around. I said, his Monte Nuta? The hell? Now, I know what Monte Nari means it's to maintain. So it must have been his maintain, his, his kept woman. So I said, yeah, I want to meet her. She came and said to me, I, I, you know, had a little Monte Nuta, the, your uncle. It's like, it was nothing. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I, mean, I don't know. There's a lot of weird stories that, that are in that book. Uh, the more you research, the more you find out the truth, because your parents don't tell you the truth. I mean, when you're 12 years old and you say, what about this? And they'll say, oh, they'll just say anything. And, and you know, I don't, uh, I don't even know how much they, they knew because if their parents didn't tell them, of, of course, uh, they wouldn't know. I, I, I didn't find out about my great grandfather uh, marrying a 30 year old woman until, you know, again, I was doing research and I found his birth certificate and it had, you know, my great grandmother listed on there as his wife. And then 1913, I think it was, he married another woman. And, but I had no idea that I had cousins Relative. from there. Yeah. 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 So my father, I mean, we just met them in June. My father had a first cousin. Nobody ever said anything. I had no clue. The only thing my father said once was that he had family in Torre del Greco. And outside of uh, Naples. Outside yeah. of Naples, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. But he didn't say who, why, when, you know, nothing. Uh, and, and and I know you mentioned in your book, you know, something about things things don't happen by accident. You know, Nicola contacted me two months before we went to Italy. I'm your cousin. I'm going to meet you when you come to Italy. And then he brought me <laughs> to, he brought me to his uh, Zia. My father's first cousins also. Never knew these people existed. It's 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 hard, it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe. Well, there is one story in my book. My, there was a story about my uncle, my mother's uh, brother, who was 
captured at the second, the second World War, and he was in Albania. And when he came back from Albania, this is the, my mother's story. He found out that his wife had spoken to an American soldier that was coming through the town. So, I'm, uh, you know, I'm like skeptical anyway. Years later, I, did you? I don't know if you've read this. In my, I was working. I, I, I had a. I retired from Carnegie Hall. I was the director of real estate for Carnegie Hall. And I took like a part-time job managing a building in in the Bronx, in Riverdale. Mm -hmm. There was a problem one day with a guy smoking on his balcony and it was whatever. So I called the guy in. and to make a long story short, he, he, he went through this kind of like the same kind of background that I had. He was in the 9-11. He was there in 9-11, and so was I. He lost his wife to cancer, so did I. So, oh, and he said, you know, my mother-in-law lives with us, and she said that she knows that name, Fumo. I said, well, go up and ask her what town she came from. So he went up, he called me back up, and he said, uh, she says she comes from Coliano. What? And then I hear her in the back of saying, they ask him if his mother's Maria and his brother is Alberto. Man, I ran, I got on the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> I went up there. She comes out and says, oh my God, golly qual. He looks just like his uncle, who was her first boyfriend. Wow. Oh my God. I <laughs> said, what the hell? Let's sit down. So, I asked her the story about my uncle and, and his wife. She said, what? He wasn't having, it wasn't because of the American with cigarettes. His wife took, thinking that he was dead in Albania, took up with another guy. So when he, when he came back, the wife was, that, that was all around the town. And I said, come on, man. And anyway, he did forgive her because things you're a young person and you think your husband's dead mm. and the guy the guy down the road is after you. you you know you probably i understand that but my mother was dead by then so i i didn't get a chance to say hey mom you why did you lie to me but but i'm sure she lied to me because she didn't like the story yeah yeah but, yeah probably probably sure it wasn't a good story do you know why they they came to America. I mean, we, I mean, we know basically because they they, you know, had to eat and everything like that. But is there any stories behind why they came? And well, that's an interesting question because, as I said, he fought in the First World War. Before he went to war, he must have been eighteen. It, it said on his his uh, uh, matriculation papers that he was a mechanic, mechanical. I heard he told me that he worked for the railroad, which in Italy was a good job. You know, you, you, you start with whatever you do, shovel coal and the, the steam engines. And then he worked his way up and he was promised that after the war, he would have his job back as they do here, I guess. When he got back to the little town, Cogliano, his job, Italy was in shambles. Mm. Uh, in fact, he came right around the time that Mussolini marched on Rome. I'd like to think that's why he came, but I don't, I don't know that that's the thing. But the fact is he came. How he got into the United States, that was pre-1924, pre so I think it was pretty easy to get into the United States at that time. He had an uncle in Newark. So he came to the United States and uh, worked as a mechanic. Uh, now, they, both my mother and father learned English very quickly. And I think I, I wanted to do some research on this at one time. I think he, he, both he and his father, the guy that was murdered, in, were, they could read and write. They were literate. My mother was lit in Italian. Mm -hmm. My mother was literate in Italian. She could read and write Italian. Most of the people, I don't know what the percentage was that, that came over, they were illiterate. 
So when you're illiterate in your language, it's harder to learn the new language, you know. But they, when I was born, my mother was speaking English, you know, with an accent. But and that was 1940. She came over 27. So in 13 years, she was fluent in English. So I, I don't know that. I think there's a misnomer about the fact that the people come over here and they think it's the greatest thing in the world. They came over here for opportunity. My mother did not like America because she told me when she was in her 80s, I said, my mom, the, you know, you've been here all these years. I said, what do you think of America? She said, no, me piace. I said, well, you've been here so long, you, know, you don't like it. I said, why? She said, you made it kind of sort of stupid. The Americans are stupid. Okay. Now, I don't know if they had problems. You know, they lived in a in an yeah. Irish neighborhood. I don't know whether the, there didn't seem to be a problem with a redheaded kid because everybody thought I was Irish anyway. So I never heard anything about my mother. And maybe they had problems. I don't it's know. It's possible. Yeah, it's, 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 it's possible. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, and I know you talk in the book about the, the you know, the, the dialects and everything like that. You know, my, my parents, uh, my father's family was from Naples. My mother's family was from Bari, and they used to fight over to all the time over who spoke the proper Italian. And oh. um, <laughs> the, the, the one thing that I learned over there when we went to Calabria, you know, they spoke Italian, of course, you know, day to day yes. conversation. Yes. But when yes. they sang the song, they sang the song in a dialect. And yes. I asked them, I play a little bit of guitar and I wanted to learn the song. Uh, and I said, could you send it to me? And uh, it looks like no language I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> well, Calabre? It was a Calabre style? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, God, I don't know. <laughs> uh, now, I, I met, actually, last night, no, Monday night, I met a, a, a woman from Genoa. Whoa, whoa that's kind of, gee, I mean, obviously, she was a young girl, so she spoke Italian. You know, she said, she speaks only Italian. I guess once in a while they go around and speak Genoese, but that's got to be totally different. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the misnomer is that these people are speaking bad Italian. They're not speaking mm -hmm. bad Italian. They're speaking dialect. That when they came together and decided to use the Toscana dialect as the basic Italian, there was a discussion among the intellectuals, and well, I guess it was in the 1300s, or, you know, way back, whether they should use Sicilian or not, because Sicilian had poetry written. So it's not that it's, there's good Italian and there's bad Italian. There's standard Italian and dialect. Everybody speaks standard Italian now. If you if you're over the age of if you're under the age of sixty, I think everybody speaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what they were speaking. They were all, you know, they were all speaking. Uh, you know, they were all speaking Italian. Um, but yeah, I don't, you know, we had because we went to several different regions, and you know, the dialects are all a little bit different. I mean, I mean, I know my mom's Bade's dialect is vastly different than than you know the, the standard Italian. So I so I have to ask you because only because I had never heard of is it Pussyunk Avenue or Street? Never Passy heard of up. that. Yeah, never heard of that place until yeah, it's South this, Philly. This past Sunday, when I interviewed Rich Leto and Eric Lucera from there, and uh, and now it pops up again five days later. So tell me about tell me about South Philly and Pussyunk Avenue. Well, the funny thing is I went back and found the house where he lived. It was, uh, you know, multi-family place. What do you call it? But what, whatever, it's now, it's like a couple blocks from South Street, Philly. Those apartments are probably a couple thousand dollars a month now. You know, it's all yuppified. Yeah, yeah. But uh, at that time, it was this boarding house. I don't know. I wish I knew. The guy that killed him was his partner. And from what I understand, they had an olive oil business where they delivered olive oil in Pittsburgh. And he fell down the stairs, but the partner. And he, pro my, uh, he, you know, I don't know my grandfather's story. I, I, we only know this story because my uncle went to visit this guy in jail and got this story. And my uncle, my grandfather never took care of the guy. 
Then, to add insult to injury, he took up with the guy's ex-girlfriend. And that was too much for the guy. That's why he, he killed him. But he killed him in the middle of the street. Cop was right there and arrested him. Uh, but anyway, yes, past, past Young Avenue is in South Philly. It was the neighborhood of all Italians. It's now the yuppified, or whatever the word is, gentrified. Well, it's, you know, it's no different than, than Brooklyn. It's, you know, same thing. I mean, those apartments, you can't touch those places anymore. Uh, <laughs> I know. I, had, I bought a house in Park Slope in 1979 for $40,000. I won't even tell you what I sold it for. Park, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, I, in Brooklyn, when, well, anyway. Uh, yeah, Bensonhurst, is, it's all Chinese and uh, what, Russian, I guess. I don't, I don't think there are many Italians left in Bensonhurst. No, it's, it's, it, it's the same thing in Corona and, and a lot of the old neighborhoods. Um, they, you know, most of the Italians are gone. Um, my dad, my dad covered, he was a photographer for the Daily News for 40 years and he oh, covered, God. he covered Brooklyn in the, he was in Brooklyn in the 50s and up until probably about 65, maybe. Um, and then he covered Queens. So um, you, you saw his pictures in the paper, that's for sure, in the Daily News. And uh, he's he um, one of the few people that I know that really, really loved their job. He loved being on the street. Uh, how did he get that job? Uh, but that's an interesting story. He always wanted to be a photographer. And... Um, I guess he was 18 when the war broke out. And um, I guess in 42 or 43, he enlisted and he wanted to be a combat photographer. And they told him he was a, he was a um, he was like a copy boy at the Daily News. And they told him he couldn't go right into photography because you had to be a professional photographer to be a combat photographer in yeah. the army. That and sense. he wasn't. So, but they told him they would send him to Signal Corps School in Monmouth, New Jersey. He got two stripes and a technical straw sergeant thing right out of boot camp. And they said the life expectancy for a combat photographer is six months. So you'll get to do it eventually. Mm -hmm. um, but he had a punctured eardrum, and they they um, they released him from the army right after this gig in, in Fort Monmouth and he went to the news and because all the photographers were in the war he became a he, photographer uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? so then what happened was when they came back and got their jobs back he was a newsreel uh, photographer for uh, WPIX um, from probably about 46 to maybe 50 or 51 and then, then he started. Then he was back on the, you know, doing the photography, the the still photography. Um, but I tell people, you know, everybody takes a picture these days. People don't understand the the, the talent that these men had. Yes, yes. Taking those mm -hmm. pictures with a speed graphic, with two plates, uh, and the shots that the, I mean, you know, my father had to carry around this big giant bag on his back with plates and flash bulbs. And that yeah, they held camera. the flash that Yep. What did his father do? Yeah, well, you see that you see behind me, you see the Sorrentino hand embroidery sign there. Yeah, um, my grandfather oh. and his brother, they had an embroidery uh, shop in New York really? City, and they made um, uh, bridal veils and bridal gowns. And if I go this way, you see the little boy there, a well, young man. That's my uncle. That's mm. my father's brother, and the man in the hat is uh, my grandfather's brother. Now, how did he learn the business in, in Europe? I, I have no idea. The only thing I could think of is my grandmother's aunt came in 1905 with her, her, her husband. And from what I learned, he, was, he had some kind of leather business. He either made shoes or he made wallets or something like that. And the only thing I could think of is that he... You know, war was breaking out, 1914, World War One was breaking out. The only thing I could think of is that he told my, or they told my grandmother, if you come to America, 
maybe they would help them set up shop or whatever. But I, I don't, don't really know the whole story because I don't think he did that in, in Italy. He was actually in the seminary, uh, my grandfather. And um, he told the story that my grandmother would come past and flirt with him. But the <laughs> real story apparently was her, she came from wealthy families. She was, she was from two noble families. That her fancy dancy schmancy carriage broke down in front of the seminary and he was outside. He helped him repair it. They gave him a ride someplace and that was that. <laughs> that's that's yeah, that's the story. Well, there were definitely two groups of Italians that came over. There were the peasant group that came over the Zapava Latera. And then there were the uh, the kind of uh, merchant, not merchant group, but the craftsman group, which mm -hmm. my father my father was a fabro, and they're definitely different. You know, I don't know how how it, it's always. It, I talked to a woman the other day. I don't know. Have you ever heard the term the, by the guy by the name of Idala, a, no, a lawyer? No. You don't remember a guy named Artie Idol that he used to do Friday night fights? No, I don't remember, but... Okay, anyway, I talked to this kid, Artie Idol, whose father was a famous lawyer, defense lawyer in uh, in New York City, right? Called The Hat. He had a big mustache twisted up, and he, he did all the mafioso types, right? Anyway, I talked to him, and this is Monday night, I talked to him and his wife. You know, his, his wife, went to Fordham, he went to NYU Law. Now, that was that was not normal. You know, that, that was uh, most of the Italians at that time were not in, they were just interested in, you know, making money, not sending their kids to school. So the fact, and a woman, Sicilian woman, who went to Fordham and became a teacher, and then her husband, whose father actually was a fight guy became went to NYU law school mm -hmm. I, I, that's pretty good I like those stories and there's always a story about one guy in the family who you know the teacher comes in and says hey this kid's different than the rest of the kids in your family you know I'm going to take care of him and the kid becomes a doctor and the rest of them are working construction or something I like those stories they're very interesting stories well, yeah, and I interviewed Dr. Visco, uh, who actually I didn't know when I first found him that we grew up in the same town, College Point in Queens. He's about 10 years older than me, probably about your age, roughly. And uh, his grandfather, they were, I think they were jewelers in Italy. Um, but his wow. grandfather put uh, painted on the ceiling of the, the, the bedroom um, the... A medical book and something else medical. And he told his kids, you're going to be doctors. Mm -hmm. And the whole family of either pharmacists or doctors, I mean, for the last 60 years. Well, that was the big, the big, big thing to become a doctor or a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. And he instilled upon his kids. This is what you're going to do. You're going to read these books. You're going to do that. And, and, and they did it. It's an incredible story. I mean, Dr. Dr. Visco is, uh, he was the, um, the chief cardiologist, head of cardiology in Metropolitan Hospital in New York. He just retired, I guess, maybe two years ago or something like that. Um, but yeah, and he had, they had a, his father, his mother and father, his mother was one of the very first female pharmacist in New York City. And they opened up a, ph a pharmacy in College Point. And, you know, when he's telling me these things that, I, actually, I didn't even know he showed, I saw the picture and I said, I know, I know that place. Uh, so it, it's amazing how these things, you know, sometimes come together and you, you, you find people that you never would expect to find. Um, and I know you mentioned a little bit in the book about, uh, you know, a couple of mafia type of things and stuff like that. And everybody thinks we're all mafia, which is crazy. But uh, my dad, he used to take uh, the Gallo brothers pictures all the time, usually coming out of court. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and one year, uh, one day, 
uh, Joey Gallo's coming out of court and my dad is taking his picture. And there was this guy that kept pushing the camera out of the way. Can't take a picture, can't take a picture. So my, fa my father knew, I mean, he knew Joey Gallo. He knew him pretty well. And he said, Joey, I can't, what's, I can't take a picture anymore. Don't worry about it. It was going to be taken care of. The following week, they found this guy in the truck of a car. <laughs> the guy that blocked them. Up with the, the... <laughs> you know, you know. And my father says, I have no idea. I, he says, I hope it wasn't because of me. <laughs> a lot of these mafiosi, I taught, I don't know if you've ever heard of Holly Prep in Brooklyn. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I taught in Holly Prep from 78 to 82. And that was, it was half Jewish and half Italian. I don't know how many of the Italians were from Mafioso family. Paul Castellano, I don't know. He was, anyway, the point was that their their fathers, like Castellanos and the big Mafioso guys, did not want their kids, for the uh, uh, most part. They did not want their kids in that business. And I had these kids were freaking smart. We, they went to Columbia. They went to, you know, they because the, the, the father said, no way. Or, or somebody said, no way you're going to go in that kind of business. So, it, it, it you know, the guys that were in the mafia, were they were bright guys. They just... That was their way to make money, I, you know. But they, I, I, I they didn't want. Uh, it's not like the Godfather. Actually, the Godfather, though, he did send them to college. Yeah, so yeah. I, But the, 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 yeah, they're interesting stories too. Um, yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I always it was so funny when my father told us that story because we were like, what? Uh, but you know, he would he 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 liked to have his picture in the paper, like. Like Gotti, you know the the same same kind of thing. Yeah, he, sure. He Teflon Don. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He 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 loved it. And I know you talk. I I mentioned this on a couple other uh, podcasts. Um, the uh, the differences in Italian food because uh, you've been there so many times, so you know probably better than most of us. Uh, but people don't understand. You know, even Italian Americans, they don't understand. And we got a real feeling for that when we were there for two weeks the food <laughs> italian food here is not italian food in italy no and, and, and what people don't realize okay my mother comes over here in 1927 the cuisine from 1927 to 2000 2022 it's changed in italy dramatically mm. you know because the italians the one thing about the italians is they they love creativity, so they they love the idea of creating new things in food. So you go over there. I mean, no one's eating baked ziti. Uh, I don't. I don't even know. And some of the other things, like I, the one I like is chicken parmigiano. They they don't have that. That's <laughs> but then, then it, 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 I, again, I said I was speaking to this Genovese people person. And she was saying the same thing. She was saying that I said I lived in Austria. She said, oh, the food is terrible. It's true. Compared, to, you can't even compare the Italians. So, okay, I'm a little prejudiced. But everybody says that. Non-Italians say that you can't compare the Italian food to anything else. It's the best. And when you come back, you got to find a restaurant that at least matches it a little bit, you know? We do have one around here where I have a place in Bucks County that I think I, think, I, think I talked about it. Uh, it it's yeah. close. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I know. And what I what I love there is when we went when we were in Montebello in the in the mountains there, everything was made by them: the cheese, the ham, the wine, everything, the olive oil, everything. And you know, it's just so incredibly good and fresh and 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 everything um and it was it was funny because you know then to them was like breakfast especially you know they you know they don't eat ham and eggs and things like that uh but to your point about living in austria we lived in england for two years it's what brutal. year we were there from 
90, late 94 to uh, late 96. <laughs> I remember going there in the 60s and 70s. It was brutal is right. You had to go to like a foreign restaurant. I think it's a little better now. I mean, I don't know. Because... Well, you know, uh, there are some things I, I should have bashed it completely. Like we liked, we, we would like going to um, the pubs on Sunday. Because they would have like a three course roast meal, like roast beef or roast pork or roast turkey. And that was always good. You get a little starter and you have the, the roast and then the dessert. And it was cheap. It was like five pounds, five pounds fifty. Uh and it was, you know, good value for the money. I used to cook for, you know, my my English friends over there, and they were like, <laughs> how, how did you learn to make this? <laughs> how did because I was cooking you know, our American Italian food, like like eggplant parmesan and uh, well, yeah, parmesan is, and things like which that. Which is good. It's yeah. not that that it's bad food. It's just not the same as the one in Italy. It's not as good. Yeah, it's, yeah. We said I said to this girl the the, the other night. I said the Alto Grill on the Autostrada in Italy is better than most Amer <laughs> Italian American <laughs> restaurants. The Alto Grill. Everybody says that they get off on the Alto Grill. And it's unbelievable. They can't govern themselves, but they can do everything else perfectly, the Italians. They can't govern themselves. They never have been able to govern themselves because of their history, you know, that they've only actually only been, to, how long have they been in Italy? 150 years? Yeah, yeah right. You know, right. Uh, and it was just the time. I think the one of God of all these men. But you know, who, who cares if they can govern themselves or not? Because the food is great, the people are great, the scenery is exactly. great. Exactly. <laughs> it doesn't. The government doesn't bother me when I. If you <laughs> if you're rich in Italy, it is unbelievable because you have everything in the world that you need. You want to go skiing? Okay, go skiing. You want to go to the beach? Okay, which we go? Which side you going to go? Anything you want to do? You want to go to? You ever go to Matera? No, we were we were we were gonna go, and then I we had to change the trip around. But I, I hope we're gonna go next year and, and get there. That's an unbelievable town, mm. and the story, you know, it was written by a guy named uh, Carlo Levy, who was a, a, a Jew. That, that that's the other thing that people don't know what the the Jews in Torino were like. They were this was a high class group of people who were Italian. You know, yeah, they were Jewish religion or whatever, culturally Jewish, but they were Italian. Well, they got screwed by Mussolini, but only because of circumstances, you know. Well, you, well, you know, I, I interviewed a guy from um, up that way, uh, Jewish, and he didn't know he was Jewish until he was 30 years old. I, I heard that. I heard that story before. Yeah. I had a, my friend from uh, Rome says he played with kids. He never knew they were Jewish, so they got married. No, yeah. they're Italian. Well, it's it's a pretty easy to meld into the Italian culture. I mean, it's not exactly a hard, not a rigorous culture. You know, you go to cafes, and uh, I gave a speech once when I was teaching about being Italian, and it has nothing to do. There's no race. There's no Italian race, as I can attest to, being a redhead. It's a cultural thing, and some of the best Italians are not Italian. You know, but they've adopted that lifestyle. They live in Italy, and they're they're Italian now. Well, you know, and and I've I've seen these people. They've done the DNA test, and then it comes back they're fifty percent Italian, and thirty percent this, and twenty percent Greek, and and they're all bent out of shape over it. And I tell them, that's just your DNA. That's you, you know, that's different from your culture. Of course, you know your, exactly. your culture is Italian because that's where your grandparents and great grandparents exactly. where everybody lived. You know, why are you getting bent out of shape? Because you have 20% Greek in you. Half of Italy has 20% Greek in them. So. Exactly. Especially Sicily. Sicily, Arab and Jewish. You know, I have a little bit of Ashkenazi Jew. Yeah, me too. This is, yeah. This was a, a peninsula that everyone went to, you know, starting from way back when. The, 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 so... Uh, of course, young people went there. Young guys went there. They met young girls, and they had kids. And the, that's why it's a great mixture. It's a great. It, that's why the Italians and the Sicilians are so strong, because 
they they're mixed. It's like the, the strongest dogs are the mixed dogs, you know. Uh, yeah, and that's why the and that's why the food is so good too, because the food is a mixture oh, of every, every culture. Oh, you know, and depending exactly. on where you are in a peninsula, it's completely different. I mean, you could you could get Arab kind of food in Sicily that's d- delicious, you know. Oh yeah. Oh well, we're bragging, Bob. <laughs> that's okay. We're allowed to. We're Italian. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I said. I said that I have relatives. I, the Italians love to give each other accolades. Oh, you know, man of the year and this and that. And, it, you know, it, they love all the people and they love to say, you're doing really great. I mean, my cousins always used to say, oh, Bobby, you're so great. You're so good. Now, I mean, I, I can't imagine an Englishman or an Irishman saying that to one of their relatives. You know, uh, anyway. <laughs> I, I think it. I think it's the comedian Sebastian. I think it was Sebastian Maniscalco who said, you know, growing up they would say, you know, what are you? I'm a hundred percent, a hundred percent Italian. I'm, and what are you? I'm half Italian, half embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife is half Italian and half Polish. She, she, obviously, the Italian culture took over. She doesn't know anything about being. I don't want to demean Polish culture, but. Uh, if if you have a choice between those cultures, it's a little hard to to, to go up against the Sicilian culture, especially. It's a hard, you know. Yes, most people would take that culture. The anyway. Yeah, yeah. My wife is she's half Sicilian and half Puerto Rican. So, oh, that's a great mixture. Oh <laughs> God! Now I cook the rice and beans, and I cook the Italian food, and uh, you know. So uh, I've had to learn to uh, to adapt a little bit as far as. How to make pork, Puerto Rican style and Italian style, and how to make rice and beans. Thank you uh, for interviewing me, Bob. Oh no, it was my pleasure. Great story. So before we go, is is your book available? Can people buy it? I guess, yeah. I guess you can go online and buy it. I I don't even know. I should try and see if I can buy it because I wrote it years ago. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think you should. If if they they can't, you need to make it. You need to do it so they could buy it. In fact, I could tell you who to send it to. But uh, it's a great book, a great stories in there, and I, I you know, really, really enjoyed um, all the all the stories in there. So we need to get it out to people to read. All right, Bob. All right, all right. Thanks again. <laughs> Thank you.